Hello Crime Time Podcast, it's Joshua Miles and welcome to the second episode of this podcast featuring myself, Kirsty Sky. Say hi Kirsty again. Hi. Molly Westbrook. Hi everyone. And Dark Curiosities. Hello. Thank you to everyone for your kind words about our first episode. We're working really hard to make sure that all your comments are taken on board and trying to iron out all those teething issues that we're having. Uh, we are a new podcast. We've never done this before, so there's bound to be a few teething issues. So thank you for holding out whilst we uh, fix those. This podcast is a laid back true crime podcast, but despite its nature, this podcast has not been made to cost us respect or anything like that. It's just been made to spread awareness about multiple different cases by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. You can find links to the sources used for this episode in the episode notes. Now, I saw that a few people were actually a little bit confused about the structure of this podcast, so let me explain how these episodes are set up from now onwards. Each episode is split up into three parts. In the first part, we're discussing an oddity in the news, something a bit more lighthearted to start us off, usually something a bit more funny in the headlines, such as someone committing a crime with a name tag still on, or just a downright weird case. In the second part, one of us will present a full true crime case, followed by a discussion of this case. And then in the final part, we'll talk about case updates and any other little uh, bits that relate to true crime. I hope that cleared up any confusion. And with all that being said, let's delve straight into this podcast. Cue the theme music. Today's oddity in the news comes from Houston, Texas, United States, and boy, the headline is honestly one of the funniest things I've ever read. It's probably going to make you laugh out loud so much. Okay, okay. This has actually been on Twitter a lot recently, so you guys might have seen this. Um, (laughs) The headline is, Robbers stormed a Popeyes in Houston demanding chicken sandwiches at gunpoint (gasps) after being told that the location was sold out. Oh my god. Oh my god! Oh. What? I mean, that's so, uh, I know being I know being hangry is a difficult to take, but there's no need to. There's no need for that. That is embarrassing. Oh my god! Popeye's pandemonium reached new extremes Monday night when a group of people at a Houston restaurant location demanded the new popular chicken sandwiches at gunpoint. Now, according to a local Houston news channel, two women and three men approached the Popeye's carrying at least one firearm as they were told the sandwiches were sold out at the drive through window. An employee fortunately was managed uh, managed to lock the front door to the restaurant before the group actually entered. Oh my god. <laughs> I have sorry. never heard of something like that before. That's crazy. Employees on the scene said the group appeared solely interested in acquiring the sandwiches and had actually left an infant child inside a nearby vehicle. <gasps> oh fortunately, there were no injuries at all and the Houston police are currently on the lookout for the would-be robbers. You see, Popeyes had actually sold out of its chicken sandwiches uh, world worldwide, uh, nationwide, and it isn't actually expecting to restock this until later in September. And uh, these these are brand new chicken sandwiches that they launched, and clearly they had been such a massive hit. And they did actually predict that they'd be popular, but despite that, it did sell out. <laughs> Just imagine loving a chicken sandwich so much that when you hear they sold out of the drive through <laughs> you pull up into the car park, leave your kid in the car, and oh then try and storm the restaurant with a group of your friends and demand they make the sandwich you don't try and get like any money from the register you don't like you know the normal things that people do when they rob a store you just ask for chicken sandwiches and honestly when i'm hungover i can totally relate to that (laughs) i was gonna say if i was ever convicted of a crime it would probably be one similar to that (laughs) i can see where they're coming from (laughs) <laughs> what's crazy to me is they got away with this attempted robbery with no uh arrest being made but like what exactly have the police put on the wanted posters i know wanted <laughs> chicken sandwich cravers on the loose <laughs> oh, it's an actually a ridiculous case i'm really <laughs> glad that nobody did get hurt um and it is quite a serious case because they did storm the restaurant with a gun and mm-hmm. there is the possibility that someone did get hurt did, could have got hurt, but nobody did, thankfully. Mm, um, yeah. It's also really funny to me that they left their kid in the car. They're just like, no, one priorities. second. <laughs> it's like, today I'm choosing my chicken sandwich over my child. <laughs> <laughs> oh, also, 
a mood. Honestly, it's like <laughs> when the I, the um, milkshake machine breaks at McDonald's. Oh my god! Um, and you're or like, the machine excuse me. Um, oh heck! Uh, yeah, exactly. And you're like, I need that. So I relate, but also I don't condone gun violence to get the food you need. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this more lighthearted segment. We'll be right back in the next segment where Kirsty will be discussing a very, very interesting case. Okay, so in today's case, I'm going to be discussing one from the UK that... Um, involves two individuals called Mark and John. Just to clarify this particular point, these are not the real names of the individuals involved because there are laws in place to protect their identities. Um, So basically, back in the early 2000s, uh, internet chat rooms were a very like popular activity for teenagers, like in particular MSN, because mm-hmm. you know you could chat to anybody, be anybody you wanted, be completely anonymous, sort of thing. Mm. And um, broadband was like a huge thing; like it was just sort of it. Well, I don't think it was brand new at the time, but it was getting more and more popular. Um, and like I say, MSN was like a lot less secure than social media these days. Like you didn't need to verify your identity like through like email or text or anything like that. So you could be like anybody that you wanted. And basically, this these chat rooms are central to this case. On the 29th of June 2003 in Altrincham in Manchester, there were reports of a stabbing in a dead-end alleyway in the Goose Green area and emergency services found a teenage boy lying in a pool of his own blood and he was actually quite close to death. His his organs were beginning to fail um, and next to him uh, was his friend he was present there as well and the teenager who had been stabbed was this uh, John and I will explain a bit more about them personally uh, in a bit but John had sustained two deep stab wounds one of which was on his chest and the other which was on his abdomen and it was at this point that it was noted by Uh, emergency services that the knife used was a kitchen knife as it was sitting nearby uh, to where John was lying and John was quickly transferred to hospital for treatment and by this point it was like super urgent that he had to get to hospital as soon as possible because he had very extreme injuries and if he wasn't attended to quickly enough he would have died so According to a number of reports, the surgery was very complex uh, and the teen's heart actually stopped twice during surgery. Oh my god. Um, but after his operation, he was taken to recover and he went to ICU and police spoke to John's friend who was with him at the time, who is Mark, and Mark recounted to police that whilst they were walking through the green, the two were actually confronted by an unidentified male who was described as being somewhere in his 20s, wearing all black jeans, a hoodie and a black, uh, a white baseball cap. And according to Mark, the unknown man had tried to shove one of them like down the alleyway but during the boy's efforts to free himself from his attacker the unknown man pulled out a knife and stabbed John before fleeing the scene. Greater Manchester police appealed to the public in helping to identify John's attacker as they were kind of fearful that the attacker would strike again so it was at this point that like I say, they appealed to the public. And as they normally do with these sorts of situations that happen in the public, police went to look at CCTV footage from the nearby vicinity of where the stabbing had taken place. And they actually found a camera which faced the alleyway. And 
a whole crazy story start to unfold from that particular point. So I will speak about Mark and John themselves as individuals. So Mark was a 16-year-old boy from Stockport. Uh, he was an only child of working class parents. And according to a number of reports, he had a very you know normal upbringing, uh, a happy childhood. And he did just normally at school. He he just performed very averagely, but he was quite well liked. Whereas John was sort of the complete opposite of Mark. He was 14 and he was from the Heedle Heath, I think that's how you say it, um, area in Stockport, again in Manchester. And John was from a middle class family and actually went to a private school. He was extremely intelligent and uh, he got very, very good grades at school. But he was bullied because um, of his olive skin and lots of people questioned his sexuality as well. Uh, John didn't have a good father figure in his life and he actually found out, I think he was four years old, when he found his birth certificate and he found out that his father wasn't actually his real father. Um, his real father was apparently quite a violent individual and there's even one story that I came across that claimed that John's biological father actually tried to abduct him when he was a baby. Um, so John had a very sort of troublesome upbringing. He didn't have the easiest of lives in comparison to Mark. Uh, so going back to the chat rooms, which is how these two actually met, Mark, uh, who was the 16 year old, jumped on the bandwagon and joined these online chat rooms because as I say, they were extremely popular at the time. A lot of boys wanted to, you know, speak to girls on there and get to know them. And, you know, lots, lots of teenagers still do that these days, you know, yeah. uh, looking to make relationships through the internet. And it was February 2003 and Mark was logged into one of these uh, MSN chat rooms and I th it was specifically in a chat room that was for Manchester teens and uh, Mark was one of these boys who logged in very regularly hoping to speak to a girl that would eventually become his girlfriend. Now whilst he was logged in on this particular occasion a new user joined the chat and uh, this girl was known by the name of Rachel West. Now Mark started a conversation with Rachel who actually happily returned his messages without any issues and the two sort of got on really well. They spoke very frequently in the chat and they seemed to bond very very quickly and a few days after Mark and Rachel started speaking to one another um, a new user entered the MSN chat room known as John. Rachel's younger brother, the 14 year old. So this is how Mark and John started speaking. They started talking a lot uh, through these chat rooms, through private messages, and they soon became very friendly. Uh, they also started speaking to each other through webcam as well. And they actually shared a number of mutual interests. I believe they were both into football. Um, and so Mark, John and Rachel spoke a lot. And even though Mark got on with John, he actually preferred to speak to Rachel because obviously he thought that it was going to go somewhere. And she eventually, like Rachel eventually got Mark to actually undress in front of the camera during their chats. Um, eventually the two admitting that they had fallen in love with one another. And Mark and Rachel actually had arranged to meet up in real life, but before that, Mark and John actually met. And in April 2003, at this particular point, another user joined the chat room, and his name was Kevin McGregor. And he claimed to be, um, quote, very gay and a stalker, and he was actually quite a flamboyant character and he was overlooked really by others in the chat because he would just sort of um, message things that were just really really out there so people just thought he was just trying to get attention things like that and it was at this point that 
Mark had discovered that this Kevin person had actually been threatening Rachel and John and before long he actually started doing the same to Mark and what really struck Mark was that Kevin had brought up specific details of all three of their lives and Mark couldn't figure out how Kevin knew this unless he was actually telling the truth about stalking them. So Kevin then blackmailed Mark into exposing himself on webcam by stating if he didn't, Kevin would kidnap Rachel and then sexually assault her. So... Mark doing what he thought he needed to do to protect um, Rachel was, you know, he he did what he thought he needed to do to protect the girl oh he loved. Um, after this particular incident, Mark and Rachel finally arranged to meet in real life, and I believe the location was in Altrincham. And after waiting at the meeting point for a number of hours for Rachel, she never actually came. So Mark returned home and he logged into his um, his chat room, his MSN account, thinking there might have been like uh, a message waiting for him from Rachel explaining, you know, a reasonable explanation as to why she wasn't there. Um, but there was nothing from Rachel only a message from this Kevin McGregor person and the message actually claimed really like a really chilling message was that Kevin had claimed to have raped and murdered Rachel and even spoke about specific details surrounding how he killed her and obviously Mark was extremely distraught by this he didn't know what to do and he didn't tell anybody because his online life was very separate to his real life. And as a result of this, you know, losing his girlfriend, essentially, he subsequently suffered severely from depression following her death. And it was during this time that both Mark and John sort of became closer. They were sharing their mutual grief for the loss of Rachel, who, you know... Afterwards, Mark sort of stayed away from chat rooms for a little while, you know, just to to grieve his loss. Um, but after a little while, he actually returned to the chat room to speak to girls, just like he did before. Um, and this is when he started speaking to a girl called Lindsay East. And this is where the case sort of gets a bit crazy. So... Like I say, soon enough, Mark became just as close to Lindsay as he was to Rachel. And once again, they started speaking. They became very close. And once again, Mark openly exposed himself over webcam to Lindsay. And after speaking for quite a while, Mark got a, a really intriguing message from this Lindsay East character who actually revealed that she was a junior agent in MI6 and was in the chat to keep an eye on John, who she actually revealed to Mark was under government protection. So the thing was, Kevin McGregor, the bully in the chat room, was targeting John. So Lindsay hoped that Mark would help her find Kevin, um, you know, and Mark was more than willing to, to do this because obviously he was hurting after losing Rachel. And one of the conditions, I suppose, uh, of Lindsay revealing this, you know, secret information to Mark was that John was to never know that they were looking out for him, that they were protecting him at all costs. However, a couple of days later, Mark actually received an email from Lindsay East and this was a message which was supposed to be sent apparently if she, quote, was killed in action. It told Mark basically to protect John at all costs, um, just sort of reiterating the fact so at the end of April, though, Rachel actually reappeared in the online chat room and the Mark and Rachel started speaking again. He was obviously extremely confused. He didn't know what happened to her and things like this. So 
Rachel actually told Mark this really strange story and he wasn't completely buying it. Um, her story was just very off about what happened to her during her absence from the chat room. And one of these claims, which was ridiculous really, is that this Rachel claimed to have actually been pregnant with Mark's child, even though they had never met in real life. So, what? obviously, How? this left Mark really, really confused and he didn't really know what to do with that. Um, and Rachel went offline again after they'd spoken and I believe she didn't log back in again. Um, but it was at this point that one of the major characters in this story enters the Manchester teens chat room and this was a woman named Janet Dobinson who she said that she was in her 40s, she was married and she spoke with Mark via messenger and also admitted that she was uh, a spy for MI6 as well but she was in a far more senior position than Lindsay East was. Um, she apparently had cover for being a spy she was uh, an apparent estate agent that was her cover um mark was obviously unsure of janet because of his obviously his previous experiences with the chat room it was all just extremely bizarre um and janet then proceeded to actually tell mark that mi6 wanted to recruit him as a secret agent now, Janet actually promised to Mark that he would get great pay. I believe it was in the millions. And upon completing his training, he would get, you know, a license to kill. And obviously Mark was very intrigued, just like a lot of boys do, I suppose. They enjoy a lot of these spy movies. So he was obviously yeah. really, really interested in being a part of this. So he just accepted this uh, spy mission. And... He had to have an initiation test which involved Mark protecting an individual called James Bell who uh, was also not to know about his initiation test, you know, the fact that he had to protect him. He wasn't mm. to know. Um, and Janet told Mark at this point that James had been entrusted with a secret code for a safe which was filled with jewels located in the Atlantic Ocean, a code which apparently only James and Queen Elizabeth II knew. So, I know it's it sounds crazy, but it gets crazier, believe me. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Mark then actually made a startling discovery about this James Bell character. He was actually... Mark's best friend, John. So Mark spent a lot more time with John in a bid to, you know, keep a constant eye on him as, you know, part of his initiation. And he reported back to Janet Dobinson on John's whereabouts, uh, you know, where they were, what they were doing throughout the day, things like this. And Janet sort of continued to tell Mark that other intelligence officers were keeping an eye on him the entire time. And to sort of verify this, she told Mark specific details about the time he had spent with John. And this was when Mark really started to become immersed into this world of being a spy. And he didn't really think anything was awry, I guess. He, d he didn't think that it wasn't real he was he completely believed that this was you know happening you know there was an occasion there was a part of it it was part of the initiation test uh mark had to get john out of school one afternoon but even though this was successful john's mother was actually told and John's mother actually looked through messages on his computer and she also found messages between she also found messages on the computer which involved the same Janet Dobinson that Mark had been speaking to. And Mark's parents obviously found the same messages on his computer. So both Mark and John's parents warned them about the dangers, you know, online and banned them from speaking to 
this supposed spy any longer, but they actually continued to. They man they were actually banned from using the internet and things, and they both managed to find their own way to using it. John was quite addicted to the internet, so his parents sort of um switched the internet off during most of the day because it was such an addiction for John. And at night, once his family had all gone to bed, he would manage to connect himself back to the internet without them knowing. So, you know, he would do anything in his power to get back online, basically. Um, and Mark and Janet managed to get in touch with one another once again. However, this mission was very different. Janet told Mark to make John look gay. Now, Whoa. obviously, reading it like myself and researching it and things, you would think that this was, you know, extremely dodgy. Like, you would be like, nah, this can't be like, you know, a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Mark was, as I say, he was so immersed in this world of becoming a spy, he was he was willing to do anything for it. So he actually managed to um, watch porn and have oral sex with John, which in turn obviously completed his mission and his initiation test. And it was at this point that this whole crazy spy world took a far more sinister turn. And Janet at this point asked Mark if he was able to kill someone that he was close to, in which Mark replied without hesitation that he could. And it was at this point that Mark was told to kill John. So obviously Janet told a taken aback Mark that John actually had a terminal brain tumour so it was really, you know, a mercy killing. And a couple of days later, this was actually confirmed by John, who messaged Mark and confirmed this diagnosis. And Janet told Mark every detail beforehand of how he had to kill John. Firstly, it had to be stabbing that had to be the method of killing him and as John was dying Mark was to say trust me to him and that was sort of the basic structure of this um plan I guess so the day prior to the stabbing on the 28th of June 2003 Mark managed to arrange a meeting with his best friend John in Altrincham the next day and throughout the day Mark spoke to Janet across MSN chat rooms arranging sort of the final plans of how they were going to kill John so they arranged you know specifics like a remote location and to not call an ambulance straight away and for Mark to remain at the location after the stabbing had taken place for Janet to turn up disguised as a detective superintendent to avoid Mark being arrested for the crime and it was at this point that Mark was also told to wear gloves when he committed the Act so that obviously DNA and finger, uh, fingerprints, what? So that DNA and fingerprints could not be traceable. And uh, there was a late change to this plan. I believe it was shortly before 10 pm that night. There was a late change, and Mark was actually told not to wear gloves just to claim that the attacker wore gloves. And Mark was also told that if he heard from any direction, any person during this mission, if he heard code 6969, he had to abort the mission. So everything was set. It's the 29th of June and Mark meets John at the Trafford Centre. The two decide to go shopping actually for a knife, the knife used to stab John. Only, obviously, he didn't know this at the time. Um, and they managed to pick out this kitchen knife, which was actually picked by John himself. And Mark then suggested that they walked into the nearby woods. 
but he was afraid that he wouldn't hear the abort signal in the woods, so they headed to Goose Green instead. It was at this point Mark actually decided to admit everything to John about his plans, and he subsequently stabbed John, telling him, trust me, as he fell to the ground, just as he was instructed to do. Now, as his friend was bleeding out, Mark was... Obviously, he didn't phone an ambulance straight away, as he was told, and he was waiting for Janet Dobinson, but she never appeared. He called an ambulance, I believe, about 20 or so minutes later, and the police uh, arrived on the scene. Uh, now, CCTV that I was speaking about earlier on, after the stabbing, was an extremely massive clue in this case and it gave this case, it turned it entirely on its head and this CCTV which was viewed by police which was facing the alleyway where John was stabbed only showed Mark and John entering and the unknown assailant that Mark had claimed to police never entered the alley at all. There was actually no CCTV footage of any unknown assailant entering the alleyway. And it was at this point that police actually arrested Mark and charged him with attempted murder. Mark claimed to police that he was actually hearing voices in his head which told them, which told him to kill John, but he did this in an effort to sort of protect his MI6 status. And at this point, Mark was sent to juvenile detention and I believe he was around he was there for around a month. And during the time he was there, he expected this Janet Dobinson to come and get him out of juvie uh, but once again she never came and it was at this point Mark had had enough. He completely broke down and told police the entire story about what had happened and police actually realised that Mark believed the entire story he recounted involving spies. Initially they were like very hesitant about his story. They thought it was just some wild teenage fantasy, but then they realised that Mark was telling, you know, the truth. This is exactly what happened. And it was at this point that Mark's computer was seized by authorities and detectives found almost 200 email addresses Mark had been in contact with in recent months and six of these particular email addresses were found to be central to this case. So something, one, uh, one uh, member of the investigation team analysed, like I can't remember exactly how many lines of text but it was in the thousands like I, can't, I think it was about 80,000, if not more, lines of text from this chat room. And she took a long time going through the chats, but she found that there was similarities in these particular chats with five different people. All of them spelt, I believe five out of six, misspelt the word maybe. And this was clear to the woman who was analysing the text that five of these people were the exact same person that was, you know, controlling the accounts. It, it was the exact yeah. same person. So it was at this point investigators took John's computer and found that someone had actually logged in to the MSN chat room as Janet Dobinson. Now, obviously, police were very suspicious of this. They believed that Janet Dobinson was someone who was in John's home. It, was, it had to be a member of his family. And the, the person, obviously, who was Janet Dobinson was all of these other accounts as well because of the misspelling of maybe. Mm. And it was through eliminating the whereabouts of family members at certain times on the 28th, the day prior to the stabbing, 
Police found only one member at the home using the internet during that particular period, and it was John. Now, oh my god, John openly admitted his guilt uh, when he was arrested. He, like I say, he was addicted to these internet chat rooms uh, he was extremely lonely um but yes john was rachel west he was kevin mcgregor lindsay east and he was janet dobinson his friendship with mark was absolutely everything to him because he he was like i say he was extremely lonely he had no one else to talk to and he didn't want to tell mark the truth in case he lost his only friend and by creating all of these different characters, they were all keeping Mark's attention, which was what John wanted. Uh, he wanted to be involved in every aspect of Mark's life. The people who were analysing all of these different characters when they were trying to figure out what was going on, they were completely like taken aback that John had managed to create so many convincing aliases. And the point of some of them entering and some of them exiting was due to the fact that John was becoming jealous of his fake people. Um, he was becoming jealous of their relationship with Mark, so he decided to, you know, kill them off in whatever way he saw fit. And it was at this point, you know, John had fallen depressed and he actually decided that he wanted to kill himself and in doing so convinced his friend Mark to murder him exactly the way he wanted. Mark was obviously told by John, you know, to tell him that, to tell John he loved him before dying and John became the first person in the UK to be charged with incitement to murder himself. Oh my god. That's insane. This is a crazy case. I know. Um, I believe it was May 28th, 2004 was the final court appearance and Mark pleaded guilty to attempted murder and John pleaded guilty to perverting the course of justice and incitement to murder himself. John was having sessions with a psychologist and he was doing really well in rehabilitation and whilst Mark was in juvenile detention, he was a model prisoner and I, um, there's a quote here from Judge David Madison, who was in charge of the legal proceedings in court. And he's quoted as saying, each of the boys were a victim of the other, which obviously reading through this case, you can definitely see that because Mark mm. completely believed everything. He had no doubt in his mind that what he was doing was completely real and... As a result of this, uh, John was given a three-year supervision order and was banned from using online chat rooms and was only ever allowed to have internet access under supervision. Mark was also given a two-year supervision order and was also banned from the chat room and the two were told never to contact one another ever again. So that's all I have in this case. What do you guys think? That oh is one of the God. most insane cases I have yeah. ever listened to. My mouth has been on the floor the entire time. <laughs> There's so many twists and turns. Yeah. Hell. And then in the end, no one even really got prosecuted for it. I, no. Yeah, I kept trying to predict when you were saying it or who it was or what was going to happen, but I could not have predicted that ending at all. Yeah. Crazy. That was literally like the plot of a movie, but it, yeah. it was real. It was reality. And yeah. It's just insane. It really is. And the fact you said that um, he got jealous of the characters that he created yeah. himself. Yeah, yeah, I know. Whoa. It's quite, I know, it's there sinister, must be some kind it? of delusion there or yeah. some kind of... I, I'm interested in the psychology behind that. Yeah, mm. yeah. That was also, something that yeah, sort of like, drew me to the case, really. Like, I was just really, like, intrigued by the psychology behind it because I would love to know a bit more about that, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, John obviously agree. was that... John was obviously a very calculating and manipulative person, but then also on the opposite side with um, Mark, obviously he's just 
very naive like yeah. Mm, yeah. the stuff that he was being told to do mm. like any person like it's an adult for example they would read that and think you, you know there's no way that that is real yeah. um but obviously when you're young you know you'd like to believe young these things because yeah. these these young people have dreams you know and they think oh my god i'm the lucky one you know this is happening to me of all people well like i say just like to yeah. that. I, it's just difficult to believe that you know John, who was obviously, he was 14, and he managed mm-hmm. to persuade a 16-year-old that all of that was true. Yeah. Like, yeah. that must have taken yeah. some, you know... Planning. He yeah. Planning. Good, he, a, a master manipulator. Yeah. yeah. Master but, I mean, of course, manipulator. Oh and that's God. quite scary. It is. Well, like I say, like, it's just, you just sort of realise when you read cases like this, you know, how dangerous it really is out there. And obviously, I know, I know this case happened, you know, over a decade ago. But I mean, the message is still very much the same. You know, you don't know who you're talking to online. Yeah. You don't, you don't know if you know someone you've been speaking to for a couple of months is actually who they claim to be. You know, yeah, a hundred percent. You've got to be really safe. Yeah, you have to be very aware of catfishing these days. Yeah, yeah, it's a huge problem these Definitely. days. And that that's it. That kind of thing still goes on today with yeah. catfish murders and mm-hmm. people yeah. like meeting on Tinder and dating apps and that kind of mm, thing. Yeah, I still can't believe that he convinced him that he had got Rachel pregnant. I know. That, I don't. Oh, yeah. And they <laughs> hadn't like, even met. That's the big red flag right there. Yeah, I that I, that, I can't believe that. I literally gagged at that. But again, out. like that just <laughs> that just shows you know his naivety. You know, he'd never even met the girl and she's claiming to be pregnant. It's like, come on, like, any of us who would raise someone like that, you'd be like, oh, that is, like, a ridiculous joke, like, yeah, you know, but, yeah. you know, he was just, he, he just really, really, really believed everything he was told. And I think that's why, you know, with the judge saying they were the victims of one another, that yeah. makes complete sense in that, in that way, you know? But yeah, I'm sure the, the poor kid obviously suffered a lot mentally. I mean... You know, if you'd grown an attachment to somebody online and then finding out that this other guy you've been chatting to had literally murdered this other person, like, I can't even begin yeah. to imagine how he must have felt. Yeah. Um, and I, then finding so, out after all of that that it was just this one person that was supposedly, like, his closest best friend. I mean, mm. I don't even know how you would even start to get over that. Tr- it's insane. Yeah, the trauma that stems from that. I don't understand how when that person got allegedly murdered... Why he didn't go to the police or anything? Yeah. Or tell uh, anyone yeah. about that? Because that would have made I personally when I would have gone and spoken to like my parents or like the police or someone about that. Mm. And just... I guess like like uh, Kirsty said, I guess he was like his online life was a secret. I guess yeah, it was very um, it was oh. very separate, you know, from his from yeah. his real life, you know. Because I so both of them were online a lot. I mean, John, it was an addiction for him. But, you know, Mark was on his computer, like, a lot, you know? It's an insane case from start to finish. It really it's is. It's a crazy one. And that concludes the main segment of this episode. We'll be right back momentarily for our final case update segment and some more true crime. <laughs> To start off the case updates, we're just going to discuss the case of Libby Squire. Now, if you don't know this case, um, Libby was a 21-year-old student at Hull University who went missing after a night out on the 1st of February 2019. She was last seen on CCTV at a bench close to her home. A very extensive police search and investigation was subsequently launched the same day she went missing and so many volunteers and locals worked with law enforcement over the coming weeks to aid in their search for Libby. The search saw hundreds of police officers, specialists, dog handlers and members of the public involved in trying to find Libby. Sadly, her body was found in the Humber Estuary seven weeks after she went missing on the 20th of March 2019. On the 21st of August 2019, a 25-year-old man was actually arrested on suspicion of murder in relation to this case. However, he was then released pending investigation. Libby's body has recently been released to her family for funeral proceedings. 
The investigating officers told the media that they had been unable to release her body until now for investigative reasons. No details of funeral arrangements have been released, but it is expected to be a very moving funeral with hundreds of people coming out to support Libby's family. However, it must be said that Libby's family may not wish for public to attend the service, so I must ask that those local must respect the family's privacy during this very difficult time. The investigation is now continuing with a file being prepared for the Crown Prosecution Service uh, as results of the additional analysis the police conducted on Libby's body are being finalised. It is anticipated that more information surrounding Libby's case will be released after her funeral has taken place. I just like to give, uh, I just like to take this moment to offer my full support to Libby's family. My heart truly does go out to her family during such a devastating time, especially after the police held her body for such a long period of time. Um, it must have been very rough with a lot of unanswered questions still to this day. And I hope that that answers are found very soon. So myself and Dark Curiosities are going to be discussing a recently solved case. It was solved uh, just this year. So uh, we're going to be talking about the case of Larry Moncada. Um, so in January of 2019, the decomposing remains of a male body were found wedged in between an 18-inch gap behind a supermarket freezer. The remains were found at a No Frills supermarket in Council Bluffs in Iowa in the US, and the No Frills supermarket had been closed for three years before the body was found, so it was closed in 2016, but in January of this year, Contractors were sent in to remove the coolers and shelving units when they found the body behind the freezer. However, police said it was very clear that the body had been there for several years before that due to how badly decomposed the remains were and so it was going to be really difficult for police to identify who this man was and why he was behind the freezer. Eventually, only two months ago, so in July of 2019, the body was identified through DNA analysis as 25-year-old Larry Eli Murillo Moncada. Moncada was um, reported missing in November of 2009 by his parents when he failed to return home one day. His parents said that before he went missing, Larry seemed to be acting irrationally and they believe it was due to the medication that he was taking around that time. Uh, I believe that Larry was taking antidepressants, um, however apparently they were causing him to have hallucinations and Larry had told his parents that he was getting voices in his head and were telling him to quote, eat sugar. Uh, according to sources online, Larry had an argument with his parents and ran out of the house without wearing any shoes or socks and at the time there was actually a snowstorm uh, happening in Iowa. Um, Larry never returned home and so his parents contacted police who launched a missing persons inquiry but the case quickly went cold as there were absolutely no leads and there was nothing for police to go on. Um, Larry was actually an employee at the supermarket where his body was found um, and an autopsy that was conducted on Larry's body concluded that his death was accidental and there were no signs of trauma on his body and um, therefore investigators believe that they have the full explanation as to what happened to him and how he must have gotten behind the cooler is a bit of an unknown. So it's the police's theory that after he ran out of his house Larry went to his place of work at the supermarket and for some reason he stood on top of the coolers but he accidentally fell down the gap between the freezer and the wall. Former employees of the No Frills supermarket said that they also used to do this. They used to stand on top of the coolers for some reason. They used It was like a hangout spot. Um, and so maybe that's what Larry was doing before he eventually fell and got stuck. The coolers were also very loud. They made a lot of noise. And so it's thought that Larry's cries for help may have been drowned out by the noise of the freezers. And so it's thought that Larry's body was probably there since the day that he disappeared in 2009 until it was eventually discovered 10 years later in 2019. Oh, um, Following... I know... Following the news of his death, people who used to shop at that supermarket began commenting on social media about how the supermarket did always used to smell. And that's something that I don't understand. How did no one think to check where this smell was yeah. coming from? There was like a decomposing body and no one thought to check. Yeah, exactly. The yeah. smell of a dead body, if you've smelt like an animal that has died like a rat or a mouse, that itself yeah, you... is so pungent. Yeah, And yeah, then the smell yes, of a yeah. whole human... That, how mm. can you just ignore that? 
I mean, maybe the freezer, yeah. um, the, the freezer had elements that were suppressing the smell of it a bit. Mm, possibly, um, I'm not sure. Possibly, but then yeah. did they not have health and safety inspections? You think they yeah. would have noticed something yeah. like that? Aren't freezers supposed to be regularly inspected yeah. to make sure that they don't especially they don't blow Especially up yeah. if they're in businesses, you would think. You know? Yeah. yeah. That's insane to me. So that's all the um, information that we have on the case at the minute, because obviously this is all really recent, so I don't know if more will come out about that. But That's really heartbreaking. Yeah. That, is, that is truly yeah. heartbreaking. Yeah. Is, but I yeah. hope that does provide some closure to uh, his family. Mm -hmm. Agreed, his, yeah. His parents, yeah. And that is everything that we have for you in today's podcast episode. Thank you so much for everyone for tuning in and listening along with our second ever episode. For some reason, I wrote first ever episode in my scripts. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you usually listen to your podcasts. Links to all our channels can be found in the episode notes, along with links to the sources used in this episode. And with all that being said, we'll see you in the next episode. Bye! Bye! <laughs> Bye, Bye guys! Mm -hmm.